welcome everyone to the week eight of the ABCD ReproNim course. Hope you're all enjoying everything so far. We're excited to bring this uh, video cast to you once again. For the um, enrolled students, we want to remember uh, to remind them to submit their project week proposals. Uh, we invite you to use the lectures of this session and think hard about what kinds of uh, projects you'd like to work with for project week. Getting those in early, you know, helps you know all, you and the rest of your colleagues think about you know what you might want to do in the actual project week. So, no idea is too un developed or um, wacky, get those out there and gives us uh, all lots of fodder to, to think about. So that's good. The deadline for submitting these project proposals will be February 12th, two weeks before the last course session. So we can talk about those and you know, sort of bash through them you know, together. Today's lecturers are Raul Gonzalez and Adina Wagner. I'll invite them both to say hello real quickly. Raul. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Glad to be here. And Adina. Hey, glad to be here too. Great, we got this technology working working great. Uh, so a couple more reminders before I turn things over to the others. Uh, again, enrolled in students, please make sure to complete your ABCD data access uh, doc uh, status survey in the Canvas. As of today, only 23 have done that. We need you to do that so you can participate in Project Week and so we can figure out how to maximize the Project Week with uh, adding some additional folks. So we need to know who of the enrolled students you know, have that ability to, to attend. If you have your duck approved, please make sure to complete the data access confirmation survey in Canvas so that we know that you're eligible. That's the only way we can keep track of this. So please help us help you to participate. So I think that's all of my pre-announcements. I'll turn things over to Angie. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to week eight. I am really excited about this week. Um, my lab loves data lab. So it's wonderful to have Adina here. And I am super delighted to have Raul join us. Raul and I do serve as PIs for the ABCD site at FIU. And it has been a true joy to work with him on this project. Um, and then there is another course issue that I've been wanting to bring up with everybody here. And having Raul here for this week's emphasis on culture and environment is exactly the right time to do that. Um, this last summer in the US, we experienced a period of where'd we go? Um, peaceful demonstrations and protests that were marked by the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, but really represented the culmination of anger and grief that was created by centuries of racism and societal inequities. Many of us participated in those demonstrations, and we have been seeking ways to dismantle white supremacy in our own lives. Many of our institutions issued statements, and, and I know that I'm proud of my own institution for creating a 206-page equity action initiative. Um, but during this time, the reason I'm bringing this up now is that members of the ABCD study began discussing ways in which we as a consortium could address this important and timely topic. So Jessica here has shared my slides. I want to tell you a little bit about a new initiative in ABCD called JEDI, which stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, so if you could advance to the next slide. Our mission is to effect change that assures and promotes justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion at all levels of ABCD by evaluating practices and culture, providing feedback to the task force initiatives, and interacting with all aspects of ABCD. We have a JEDI Council that will invite and engage ABCD leadership to enhance awareness and set a platform for all to engage in the processes necessary for institutional change. So if you could advance to the next slide. What is key here is that ABCD recognizes that in many cases, individuals who identify as belonging to marginalized and minoritized groups are often tasked to serve on diversity and inclusivity committees that detract from their research time and further add to the already inequitable burdens that they carry. So with that in mind, ABCD has formed two entities, the JEDI Council, which provides oversight of JEDI activities and includes representation from our BIPOC ABCD scientists, and the JEDI Task Force, which is open to all ABCD consortium members, including faculty, staff, and students who have committed to doing the actual work that is needed to actualize change. So the reason I wanted to have this discussion with everyone here this week is to introduce Raul, who has recently been asked to serve as co-chair of our JEDI Council, along with Damien Fair, who you met in session one. And we're really grateful to have um, ABCD benefit from Rose leadership in this new role. And the task force itself has a lot of work to do. Um, if you could advance to the next slide, there are three separate working groups. Each are served by a membership team led by two to three co-chairs. 
Um, the first one is the equitable and inclusive methods group that is going to ensure that all the measures and all the methods that are used within the ABCD consortium protocols are reflective of all participant experiences and invite participants of all races, gender, sexual orientation, ability, SES, and cultural background. That's what they'll be working on. The second group is the diversity and inclusion within ABCD, which I am co-chairing along with Micah and Kaylin. We will work to promote a diverse ABCD workforce who are mentored by a diverse team of scientists, promote inclusive workspaces within the ABCD study community and prom promote inclusive training opportunities, hopefully much like ABCD ReproNIM, to engage with trainees from diverse backgrounds. The last group is the second reason I wanted to bring up JEDI today. Um, to let you know that this group, group is on the responsible use of ABCD data, and they've been asked to promote the principles of ethical conduct of research to prevent further stigmatization, marginalization, and injustice towards individuals because of racial, ethnic, or gender minority status. The JEDI work group here wants to ensure that researchers analyze and interpret ABCD study data responsibly and co consider the psychological social, economic, and any other potentially harmful impacts that the research could have on the individuals, communities, and society. So this working group is particularly salient to the aims of the ABCD ReproNIM course, which is why I'm bringing this up. We want to consider, we want all of the students here to fully consider your proposed analyses of ABCD data and thoughtfully ask yourself whether your analyses constitute responsible use of these data. So to begin this dialogue, um, I am going to go ahead and post in the window, uh, in the chat window to all attendees, um, a new document that we are disseminating. It is available on the materials page for week seven um, under the readings. And this is a document that provides some guidelines and recommendations for preventing stigmatizing research. So if you do plan to include analyses for project week that are centered around participant race and ethnicity, um, then we at ABCD ReproNIM are asking you that you consider factors that may perpetuate stigma in research and do the additional work that is needed to ensure that you fully contextualize your findings, particularly with respect to variables that are related to the social determinants of health. So in addition, as we move forward, ABCD JEDI Task Force is actively working on creating more resources for researchers to draw from. This will include additional training that includes assurance of ethical, inclusive, anti-racist use of ABCD data, as well as a best practices paper that outlines what we mean by responsible use of ABCD data that include examples of analyses and interpretations. Um, in addition, you know, this is bigger than just us. The NIH is going to be amending language on everyone's ducks to reflect new policies related to responsible data use and requiring this new training um, for everyone as a condition for data access. So please, moving forward, if you have additional questions, please send them my way. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, in addition, I hope to continue pushing out new resources to everyone on this important and timely topic to you as they're developed and made available for dissemination. Um, so thanks for the little bit of time that I needed to kind of push this information out to us. I hope that um, everybody goes ahead and sends me questions if they have them. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and transition and introduce Adam as today's TA. Hi, Adam. Hello. Uh, thanks, David and Angie, for the introductions and for briefing us on the uh, ABCD Jedi Council. Uh, for Adina and Raul, today we have a number of student questions that I'm excited to get to. So let's just jump right in. So I think maybe JB wanted to do one or two quick announcements first. Yeah, quickly, oh, just before okay. we jump into the questions, I just want My to. Apologies. Um, Oh, no worries. I just want to make a few announcements um, because we've been getting some emails and having some feedback from students um, uh, just asking about Project Week and kind of what resources in general they have available to them. So I just wanted to clarify uh, for some people, um, if you didn't already know, we have posted solutions to the data exercises. Um, and they're getting a little bit more challenging in this session too, because they're a little bit more computationally intensive. So if you um, are struggling a little bit, uh, feel free to look at the solutions that we've posted. Obviously, since there are many different ways to code 
um, the things that we're kind of asking you to do. These are not like the end all and say all solutions for all ways to do this, um, but they are our suggestions of how we would uh, solve these data exercises. Um, they are located, um, I will post this in the chat um, and I will also post this on the Slack and Neurostars. Um, let's see, hold on, let me post this in the chat. Um, they're located on our GitHub repository. Uh, so if you go to GitHub and then ABCD dash repronym slash exercises, um, within each week they're organized by week one, week two, week three, and so on. Um, that's where the solutions are posted for those. Um, also, we've been getting some questions just about project week. So I just wanted to take a, a quick moment to clarify some of those. You are not obligated to submit a project proposal. Um, you are encouraged to do so though. Um, uh, one of the pretty awesome things about submitting a project proposal and participating in project week is that it's an opportunity to get a team of people often with like a diverse set of skills to uh, work on and make project on the project that you want to uh, complete. So um, submitting a project proposal is a really good way to do that. Um, yes, we have also open project week to observer students who are actively participating in the class that is have submitted data exercises for uh, the weeks that we posted them. Um, and we're going to be sending out invitations to those observer students um, to participate in Project Week soon. If you are an observer student and you don't want to participate in Project Week, that's totally fine. You can just ignore that section of the emails that we're sending out. Um, and uh, as Dave mentioned, the deadline to submit a project proposal is indeed February 12th, um, but there's no uh, kind of approval or disapproval process that we go through, like uh, us as the ABCD report team, we don't say like this is a good project or this is a bad project. Um, we just encourage you to submit um, your project ideas and then uh, it's kind of like an idea space where we can have conversations about them, people can join your team and so on and so forth. So. Uh, once you open an issue on our GitHub project repository, that is the process of submitting a project proposal. Um, and we're gonna be discussing those uh, submitted ideas in the last week of the course. Uh, so get them in now if you want to submit a project idea. And that's all the announcements I have for today. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Adam um, for some questions for this week. Thanks, Jessica. Sorry for the uh, false start there. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Um, uh, this first question is for Raul. Um, this, this student um, caveats the question saying, apologies if this is a bit of an odd question, but I actually think it's a, it's a great question. We're gonna talk a lot about culture. Uh, and they say, uh, I'm curious uh, as to how the ABC study defines culture. Uh, finding a narrow but encompassing enough definition doesn't seem trivial. Uh, is it mostly measured by language spoken and heritage nationality? That's a, a, fa a fantastic question. I'm going to start with a very unsatisfying answer, and then I'm going to work my way to something with a little bit more, more meat on the bones. First, I got to talk a little bit, and I don't know if this has been brought up in other repronym discussions. It, it probably has, but maybe this will refresh folks' memories, the way that these work groups are, are organized. So, at, you know, as you know, there were groups of sites that put grants um, in for ABCD, and there was at least one individual site. These um, grants that were put in had very specific information in it, as you would imagine, with most grants that are submitted. So all the measures that were going to be administered over the length of the study, you know, they, they were all in there. And then those individual grants may have different sites put in information about how they define culture, how they planned on looking at culture. Then after the consortium was put together um, was a time to start reassessing um, how these things are organized. And the coordinating center, uh, in order to take on this large task and uh, make it manageable, created several work groups where um, clumps of measures that had some sort of thematic relation were put together to then be curated by, by that particular work group. So the culture and environment work group, which I co-chair with Bob Zucker, um, had that designation uh, simply for convenience sake and some of the measures that were in there. So now, now I'm gonna dive into the, the, you know, the media part. Now within that culture and environment work group, um, as you can imagine, and I, there are other questions that allude to this, you know, 10 minutes, culture and environment, you know, what do you fit in there? It's like everything under the world and under the sun. So the measures that we currently have that would be um, classified under culture would be things like um, ethnic identity, uh, language spoken and acculturation. 
So as you can imagine across the various sites, we have a lot of folks that are immigrants that come from other cultures uh, before arriving at, at the US and we're tracking um, acculturation. And then there's also measures that were added later on discrimination. So to, to say that we are doing a very thorough assessment of culture or a very uh, deep and with a deep and narrow definition or whether a, a, a big definition doesn't necessarily um, you know, do it justice. Now, on the other hand, I don't know of many studies of this nature and of this size with such an emphasis on biological measures like genetics and neuroimaging and neurocognitive functioning and mental health that also consider some of, of these factors as well. So if this was a study that was built from the ground up to assess culture deeply, it would probably look very different, uh, but it wasn't. And I, for one, I'm grateful for, for the amount of coverage, albeit small, um, of some of these factors that, that are included in, in the battery. So we do not have a very narrow defined definition of culture. It's more of a pragmatic definition that's used to just organize um, the gazillion measures that we have in ABCD. That's great, thank you. That really helps frame the, the remainder of the c &E questions. Uh, a follow-up to something you alluded to, um, 10 minutes for baseline c &E does seem short. Uh, were there any measures that you could not include that you wished you had time for? And, and do you still have only 10 minutes for, for, for the follow-on questions in later years? I think we've been able to car carve out a little bit more space for ourselves with time. Um, the, the first baseline assessment with the, the very brief amount of time that we had was, was uh, rough. And um, not to belittle the importance of this work group, but we've served also sometimes for really critical constructs that fall within the proximal and social environment that are not being captured in other work groups have, have fallen to, to our work group or, or we've uh, made sure that they've been in there. So I, we're now at about closer to 20 minutes for the, the youth and the parent. And some of the measures that we were not able to include upfront, we were able to include a little bit later. And there are some um, you know, behind the scenes negotiations between some of the work groups because we're given specific amounts of time for work groups, but maybe I can convince another work group you know, to, they have a little extra time. Maybe they can uh, put in this measure that we care about and, and vice versa. So there's, there's, there's cross pollination uh, between the work groups. Instead, in terms of specific constructs that we would have liked to assess, that we weren't able to do so, um, you know, one that comes to mind just because it's, it's so let me, I, I wanna share with folks just to demystify the process a little bit. And this also alludes to some of the other questions. How is it that we decide which measure goes in where? So a, a really key thing is, you know, is the measure amenable to longitudinal administration considering the developmental stage of the youth? Um, is this a measure that we're going to be able to keep using for a long amount of time? It's a longitudinal study. We don't want to be changing measures and constructs um, throughout uh, with development. So I'm saying that in part because what I think we've missed out on is, is uh, depth of assessment of a particular construct. So we've compromised depth for breadth um, a lot of times. So for example, a perfect example is uh, acculturation. So there are many very lengthy measures of acculturation that can be used. We don't have the most optimal measures of acculturation and depth of assessment of acculturation in the battery. So for the youth, which we had more constructs that we wanted to assess at baseline, we ended up with a Phoenix measure of acculturation that really uses language use with family and friends as a proxy for acculturation. We were then also able to give that to the parents um, so this very brief measure, you know, despite its flaws, allows us to at least tap into that construct, look at change in that construct over time, and then also compare divergences between the parent and, and the youth. And every time a new year comes up, even though we have a thumbnail sketch of what the battery is going to look like, there, there's a lot of very uh, avid discussion and debate among the work group members about which measure do we need to bump out now? Because what we've done is uh, reduce granularity in the assessments of the measure. So a construct where in an ideal situation, we would be able to assess every six months, we might now do it every other year or every two years or maybe twice from when the battery starts to, to when it ends. 
because we do want to make sure that we capture some other things, particularly very developmentally relevant things as, as youth are transitioning into uh, different times in their life where other things may be more relevant than what we were assessing, you know, what we're assessing at age 14 or 15 needs to be somewhat different than what we're assessing at age nine and 10. Some behaviors that just wouldn't even register on the radar at age nine and 10 are now very prevalent at ages uh, 13, 14, and 15, and we need to capture it now. So you know, I think that addresses the question. It also kind of fleshes out a little bit more um, of, of this process for choosing which measures go in and out. And also we're looking at the data that's been collected and looking to see if there are ceiling effects in a particular measure or floor effects, or if they're not being sufficiently informative to reconsider whether it's time to maybe pull a measure out and put another one in. So it's very much a living uh, process and protocol as we go through it. Thanks, Raul. That's helpful. Um, I'd like to switch to uh, Adina. Um, we have a, a couple of questions that I think I'll combine here. One is, um, how is data led typically used in practice? Is it is it best to start tracking the data set you know, during acquisition or sometime later in the pipeline? Uh, and, a, and a related question, would you recommend tracking all data set files, including like raw, you know, DICOM files or, or uh, only work at the bids level? Uh, how, how do you recommend doing that in practice? <laughs> so it's t difficult to answer the question of how data lab is typically used. It's a versatile tool, just like Git is. So the use cases are manifold. And um, I probably have five private use cases that I could differentiate for myself. And um, in neuroscience, I think alone, there are also various types of use cases. Uh, I'll uh, start with the second question because that is, that is a bit easier um, about whether um, raw data should already be tracked or only the bits of our data set. So from the point of capturing data transformations and having an accurate record of the complete provenance that uh, was that was uh, created in the course of generating any kind of research output. It is very crucial to start with tracking uh, as early as possible. So raw data, in my opinion, should definitely be something that is tracked, especially if you consider that the important step of transforming the raw data into something that is then used as the basis for all subsequent analysis, for example, your bits data set is often not questioned and very rarely transparent or, or reproducible, uh, therefore. So if something goes wrong in that step unnoticed, then the errors that have been made at this stage are propagated into the results of all of your analysis. And there, if you haven't tracked it, may be no way to ever recover that mistake or find out about it. So. I would definitely say start with the raw data. One thing that you should be aware of, though, is to keep the modularity principle in mind. So while you start tracking the raw data, um, you should uh, try to keep your um, modular study entities uh, indeed a separate data set. So while you can record the raw data set in a snapshot and maybe basic transformations in the single data set, you should then just use it as a sub data set uh, that serves as input to an eventual bits data set, for example. This also spares you any potential problems that arise if you ever share a data set with other sources and it includes um, data that is raw and thus maybe private data. So having it as a separate entity, a separate sub data set, allows you to just um, do access control on a per data set level so that you don't infringe the privacy of your participants. And uh, for the general use cases of data led, I would say in the neurosciences, the use case um, is precisely where you need it to be. If you don't use raw data, if you start with bits data sets, if you are a consumer of data, then use data led for whatever you need it best for. You can, if you acquire a new study, use data led from the very start. Uh, I certainly do it and it's very helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's all that I can say to, to that question. <laughs> Great, thanks. No, that's helpful. Um, 
I'd like to switch uh, from a kind of a technical how to use data led question to more of a evangelical question. How, how should I pitch data led to my non-technical PI for use on our, on our <laughs> I data would, sets? I would, I would say the best way to do this is to just impress them with whatever you're using data led for. Uh, demonstrate that what you're doing is reproducible even after five months or five years or when you explain it to the person that takes over the project after you or because it simplifies publication routines. Uh, that, is, that is, in my opinion, the best way to, to evangelize uh, someone who is not interested or easily, easily um, enthusiastic about technical things. The other angle that I would certainly advise is just data management, because data led is a tool that enables plenty of data management that is typically really hard to achieve. And PIs are very interested in data management uh, for, for their funding, for their lab, for the reproducibility of their results. So that's also an angle. I'm going to jump in here with a third option, which is that uh, you can also invite Adina to give a talk to your labs because she is <laughs> absolutely the best person to represent all of the different ways that data lab can be um, helpful. And in the Zoom, uh, in this era of Zoom uh, seminars, I, I think that that's something that could be considered. <laughs> yeah, happy to come. Can I ask? one additional thing so fine maybe my pi might consent to it do you have a sense of how long you know a new person has to kind of devote to learning and to, to do that transition that i would have to tell oh yeah it's going to cost us this amount of time if it's a pi <laughs> then that's depend well if it's a pi then then they will struggle because pis have 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 plenty of things to do. Uh, so if I'm and, the postdoc and I know a little bit about computing, I've just con succeeded at convincing my uh, PI to maybe let me do this if it doesn't take me too long to do or Yeah, what do I say is my amount of time? Yeah. Uh, if you if you just tell them to read the data led handbook, just the basics, they'll be done in a day and they know everything that they need to know. And uh, then uh, if they just start with data led, I think the basics are very very fast to learn although i want to advise everyone to just like get a get a good grip on the tools that you're using prior to 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 um, employing them um for everyone it's 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 a technical tool great thanks yeah that's helpful i, I think it's, it's uh, coherent with a lot of the other advice that we've given uh on on other reproducibility tools uh, like from git to containerization um, okay, uh, I'd like to switch back to you, Raul, if I could. Um, you mentioned that you're collecting measures of discrimination. Can you talk a little bit about what those items are and, and how it's measured? So I think that's a great um, measure that, to talk about in, in terms of even bringing it back to some of the, the prior questions. We did not start with a discrimination measure in the battery. But boy, you know, the last four years have given, uh, you know, people in the U.S. a lot to think about and um, the importance of capturing uh, the, these other constant contextual factors that are impacting people's lives in, in probably pretty significant ways, it becomes more and, and more important. So at, at some point where we thought that this would probably be, as the youth are developing more um, ethnic racial identity, that it might be a better time to start capturing it. So then we look for a measure. Um, we want it to be brief. We want it to be applicable to as many people as possible within the data set. And we want it to be something that we can continue to use over time. And perhaps if time were to allow something that we can, again, give both the youth and the parent, because we think that, um, you know, there's data to suggest this, that the discrepancies between some of these experiences between youth and parent can also be a source of, of conflict and, and cause other issues in, in, in the, uh, the family and for the youth. So for the youth discrimination measure, we, we couldn't find anything that kind of fit all our needs. So there was um, the Boston Youth Survey had uh, a few simple questions that we liked because it asked about very simple questions. Have you ever felt discriminated against because of the country that you were born in, because of um, your body type, because of your sexual identity, 
because of your race, ethnicity. So it covered a, a lot of categories um, without just focusing on, say, you know, race or ethnicity or um, you know, gender identity. So we captured that. And then we also wanted to make sure that we had a scale that was very well validated and used over time, which was the Finney discrimination scale that asks a variety of questions. It's, it's uh, there's a very large literature base on it. And these are questions about perceived experiences of discrimination from important people um, in, in the youth's lives. So uh, collectively, uh, we put those together to both have a well-validated measure with a very large history of literature, as well as another measure that didn't necessarily have um, as much research background, but went beyond uh, race and ethnicity in terms of a feeling of, of discrimination. And just as an aside, um, we haven't revisited the data yet, but at least at age 10 to 12, um, there was a, a relatively small percentage of youth that were at that point identifying having felt um, discriminated against. It's not negligible when you consider the amount of people with an ABCD, but it was something, you know, downwards of 5% of the youth. We thought it would be a lot more. And, at, you know, at least within our own work group analyses, just to kind of do quality analyses of the data, we're not diving deep to look at associations or whatnot. Um, it, it, we didn't break it down by you know, spe specific groups or particular sites, which all of these things might matter. Uh, but it means that there's definitely a lot of room to see what happens as youth may become a little bit more aware um, of, of these uh, factors in their lives. So that's, that's the story of our, of our discrimination measure. Thanks, that's helpful. Uh, we have another question here about uh, FIU site demographics that I'd, I'd like to address. Uh, it's a bit long, so bear with me. Uh, it says, uh, the FIU site demographics breakdown seems quite different from the breakdown across all ABCD sites uh, put together. It makes me wonder if there will be some unintended cultural aspects represented in the data uh, that are very site specific. For example, if the proportion of say Hispanic youth across the full ABCD study will be more strongly representative of the experiences of Hispanic youth in the Miami-Dade area specifically, thereby biasing out the experiences of Hispanic youth from other regions, for example, along the Mexican-American border? It's, it's a great question and sounds like a great project you know, for somebody. I mean, the, the beauty of this is that we do have these sites. So you, you look at a graph of ABCD demographics with all the sites compressed and it's like, oh yeah, this looks good. You know, this looks like the census data, you know, we're closely approximating a sample, but then you get down to the sites and, and clearly, I mean, the, the, the classification of Hispanic, Latinx, it's, it's just such a broad category with so many different experiences. And then you got to consider that people leave their country of origin and come to another country for also a variety of reasons. So it's almost like there's a selection bias when you start looking at these groups. So you wouldn't even really be able to extrapolate from these groups probably to the same group in you know, their country of origin. So Miami-Dade, I mean, we have a large proportion of Venezuelans, Cubans, um, Caribbean, you know, much less so say Mexican-Americans. Uh, we have a lot of Central Americans. So the percent Hispanic at FIU might be very similar to the percent Hispanic at UCSD because we do look similar, but the underlying makeup of that might be very different. So this is gonna require uh, folks that wanna get at some of these differences and, you know, hopefully, you know, there's probably also going to be, so let me take a step back. We do ask questions about, you know, the country where they were born, where the grandparents were born. So we know if they're immigrants or not. We don't just stay at the Hispanic classification. I mean, it goes down more deeply than that. Um, so there will be opportunities to be able to examine or ask these questions uh, of the data. And then, you know, if you really want to get you know, like go, go nuts, you know, this COVID experience that we've just had the pandemic in the last year, sites closing down at different times, rates of coronavirus being higher or lower in different places at different times, the SES of folks and the amount of people that are classified as essential workers across sites um, also changing. There's definitely opportunities there um, for individuals who are interested in getting at this kind of interface of these, uh, and it's, you know, and, and, and again, another step back to what Angie mentioned at the beginning of the talk and part of the work in the Jedi work group, you know, we don't want to leave these at just like, oh, this particular racial or ethnic group versus this other particular racial or ethnic group. It's like, what are the underlying factors that are contributing 
to these different experiences and these folks. And hopefully having all the different sites with these very heterogeneous groups is really an opportunity to kind of uh, dive into that data and see where the answers might lie. But yeah, we're pretty different at FIU. Thanks. That was a that was a great answer, and and uh, I think there were also maybe three or, or four components of that answer that could be project week uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, one more on on uh, culture and environment, if you don't mind. Um, were measures like the Mexican American culture value scale uh, administer, administered to everyone, or just caregivers that indicated that they had Mexican American cultural background, and then uh, likewise for the for the Native American uh, acculturation scale. Uh, and so on. It, it, it's a wonderful question. And I'm glad I have an opportunity to, to talk about it here because that particular scale, you know, the title of that scale itself um, might lead folks to think that we picked it for reasons different than the ones that we that that we chose it for. Um, there was a lot. So I also should do a little bit of a disclaimer. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training. I, I a lot of my research is not necessarily in this space. Within our work group, we have a lot of folks who um, have have spent decades um, asking and understanding some of these questions. Uh, so that particular scale, there's a lot of data uh, about associations with substance use and this immigrant paradox where individuals, even though they have a lot of other risk factors, the fact that they immigrated to the US, they actually have lower rates of uh, substance use disorders than um, you know, Americans who've been here for a long time. And as they acculturate, the risk starts going up. So in an attempt to try to understand a little bit what some of those underlying protective factors might be, um, there was a lot of signal in the literature for the concept of familism and family support and cohesion. And the Mexican American cultural value scale did a really nice job at assessing um, all of these kind of tight knit family values with questions like, you know, the family is the most important thing. If you have a family member who's down on their luck, it's your obligation, you know, to take care of them, those sorts of questions. So we picked it, not so much because of the Mexican American part, but rather because we thought that it captured a construct that seems to vary somewhat across cultures, but also can vary between individual families that might be relevant to understand it, its role in the development of, of substance use disorders. Thanks, that's that's very helpful. Uh, okay, Adina, if you don't mind, I'd like to switch back uh, to ask a question about um, <laughs> maybe a non-ideal use of data led. So <laughs> th th this question asks, suppose I already have a pre-processed data set that I would like to convert to a data led data set uh, after the fact, and it would be computationally expensive to maybe recreate that, that data set using data led commands. Uh, what's the best way to convert this data set to data lad and capture the, the provenance, but without rerunning all of my potentially expensive analysis. So, so the question was correctly framed. It is a suboptimal way or a non-intended way to use data lad. Data lad is not really a, a tool where you curate uh, metadata by hand. Its strength lies actually in the fact that it can do these recordings of what has been done in the data set for you. And that is important because it can make sure to not make the mistyping mistakes that a human could do uh, compared to a machine. Nevertheless, I can totally see how that is a very frustrating situation. So the process of turning an existing um, directory of data into a data led data set is really simple. You can create a data set inside of the existing directory, add the data, save it. This does not, however, give you any of the provenance that you have already uh, done. What you uh, can do as a suboptimal, but nevertheless important uh, piece of information is just to add a very, very useful long commit message, uh, use documentation files. Uh, and, and just for the record, if you, if you are really, if you, if you have a good idea of the tool, and of Git, then in principle, although I definitely do not recommend to do this, you, you could feed in the data. The, the structures that Datalet uh, creates and uses for this provenance capture, they, they are text-based. You can read uh, up on how they are structured, how they are used in the Datalet handbook, and in principle, 
because it's a powerful tool, it would allow you to feed them in, but it's nothing that I would recommend to do uh, for us. Yeah, in any case. <laughs> Great, okay. So it, it sounds like uh, Datalite can give you all of its modularity benefits in that case, but maybe not the provenance benefits. The, the, if, you, if you don't have the steps that generated uh, the result captured with data led, then you can have the result version controlled and you can have a human readable um, message um, in the form of a commit message in the form of a file that explains in your own words what has been done. But you will not, if you haven't done it with data led, have the machine readable re-executable record that would allow you or others to redo the exact computation. Unless you temper with the internals of the commit, uh, which is possible, um, but it is not an intended use case. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, there are two other sort of technical data led use questions I'd like to combine and you can yeah, uh, pick sure. which, which components you'd like to answer. Uh, the first question is, if I adopt DataLed for my local use, uh, I then have to be careful about how I handle my files that are under DataLed control and cannot just handle them in ways that I'm typically used to, for example, you know, RM, CP. Um, uh, can you say a little bit more about the potentially dual mindset one might have to have to handle DataLed data versus non-DataLed, uh, i.e. regular data? Uh, and, th and the second question, which I think is somewhat related is, uh, what if I have a local repository for my data but have to do some data processing steps outside of that repository. Okay, uh, so I'll start with, with the very first aspect of the first question about uh, how to handle um, data and whether that is to be handled differently. So um, not everything about data handling changes in data that is kept in data-led data sets. And in chapter nine of the data-led handbook, there's a complete section that goes through every single um, possible file system operation that you can do to a file copy, remove, move. Uh, and um, you can see what exactly differs, if it differs, and in most cases the operations will work as you would expect them to do. Um, related to the second question, there is a difference obviously um, in, in file handling if you are attempting to move certain data, namely the data that is annexed out of a data set. Um, so in these cases, you can have tools, for example, graphical file managers that will complain and will not work as expected. If you are a fan of your shell, for example, then you will uh, be less likely to encounter those because the tools that the shell provides are more likely to be able to handle symlinks appropriately and correctly and dereference them. Um, so while most file system operations, most file handling operations are not um, different in data led data sets, if you want to copy data out of your data set um, for whatever reason, this is perfectly possible. Data led doesn't modify your data, it doesn't store it somewhere hidden, uh, you can just get it out. Uh, if you, you want to, there are several ways, they are documented in the data led handbook. The easiest is the simple CP uh, with a dash capital L command. Um, that gets you any kind of annex data out of the data set uh, without any hassle. But there are plenty of other ways to, to get the data um, out. I don't want to reiterate them, but you can check chapter nine. It's, it's uh, all detailed there. The second thing that I want to say about the second question about getting data out of data led data sets for transformations is that you, if you want to do that, really should think if that's really something that you want to do. So um, I'm struggling to find a use case where this is really necessary, um, but maybe I'm not grasping the, the use case appropriately. But what I want to stress is that any data transformation that you do outside of the data set is a transformation that you cannot record, where you cannot capture the provenance. So um, if you can, then consider um, doing the transformation if it needs to be in a specific, um, I don't know, if, if, if it's just another data set or if it's just another project or analysis, create a new data set, um, install the data set where you would want to copy data out of as a sub data set, retrieve the data, do the transformation, have the provenance. 
uh, if it's um, like a MATLAB use case where a certain MATLAB toolbox lives in a certain directory and the data needs to be there, consider adding the required software actually into the data set so that you, instead of bringing the data to where your software or analysis project, whatever lies, um, bring the analysis software into the data set, capture it as provenance so that you have a record of what exactly has been a component or, or, or piece of information in the transformation of the data set. That, that would be my advice. I don't know the exact use case for this question, but with such questions, while it is possible to get data out of data sets very, very nicely, in the case of a data analysis, just question whether this is really something that you need to do. And I think I have missed the second part of the first question. Um, can you can you remind me? Uh, it, it was. I think you you answered it sort of. It was about um, maintaining a potentially dual mindset that one might have to have in order to work with data lab data versus ah, regular see. data. Yeah, yeah. I think um, two things. Uh, for one. My um, personal mindset with data led data is I'm more careless. Um, I'm more safe. I can remove data. I can transform it in, in ways uh, more carelessly because I'm certain that I cannot do something wrong or lose data. That's nice. Um, with regard to um, tools, I make sure that whenever a graphical tool complains about something that I have in mind, that there's this distinction between data that's kept in the annex and data that is kept in Git, same for file uh, permission errors that occur. So whenever I stumble across something uh, that looks weird, where two complaints, I, I have this as a first go-to step to check um, for finding a solution. Okay, that's. Thanks. Uh, so we have a, a few more minutes left. I'd like to try to sneak one more culture and environment question in, if you don't mind, Roel. Uh, are there any measures of discriminatory or prejudiced beliefs of participants? Yeah, that's a great question. No, I mean, it'd be nice to include something like that as well. At the same time, it, you know, this is one of these um, pragmatic things about the health of the study. You know, at, at the same time that we want to capture important behaviors, we also want to retain participants in what is a longitudinal study. And um, Angie, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I recall correctly, early on when we were trying to recruit the baseline sample and approximate the US census, at the beginning, we were harder, having a harder time um, getting enough black families in to kind of meet that category. But, but with very targeted efforts, we were able to get that back up. However, the group that we were never able to get enough of were white Americans with a high school education or lower. That was the group that ended up being less represented in the sample. I recall um, when we were doing the Irma sub study, one of the few complaints that I received from a participant was about a question that asked what the primary source was for their news. And I mean, we ask a lot of personal questions, but that's the one that really rubbed this person the wrong way. And they're like, and the, and, and the complaint was, why are you making this political? So I could imagine a questionnaire like that, which would be you know, very interesting and useful to have. The closest thing we probably have to it is about bullying and victimizing behavior within the mental health work group um, in general. So that might get at that. And, and if I could just have 10 seconds, I realized I didn't answer about the Native American acculturation scale when I answered about the Mac VS. So that scale is an exception. That scale is, I think, the only scale that we ask just specifically of Native American families, which are very um, much highly represented in the Oklahoma site and a smattering in a few places. It's a very small segment of the ABCD sample, but it's a sample that oftentimes is understudied, does not participate in research enough. So it was an opportunity to, to try to understand a little bit more about uh, various behaviors within folks that identify as, as Native American as well. So that one is the exception. Almost every other measure is given to, to everybody, unless, they, unless there's branching logic, obviously, in the measure. 
So with that, we are going to have to call an end to this session. Thanks so, so much to Raul and Adina for giving their time and their knowledge to share with us. Thanks very much to Adam for moderating our questions. Um, we hope everybody has a good week. We will follow up with all of the unanswered questions to folks. We'll po be posting those on NeuroStars. Um, so thanks and see you next week. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody.